Hi, and welcome back to PDA Dads UK. In this episode, we're going to be celebrating the season and we're going to be looking at how we manage Christmas having a neurodivergent family and basically how we minimize the anxiety and problems that Christmas can present when you've got autistic kids. As I say, welcome back to PDA Dad UK. Please do go hit like, hit subscribe, and ring the bell so that you know when new content's coming up. It makes a huge difference uh, to me personally, uh, but to how this video gets out there and how YouTube picks up on the algorithms, it's a huge thing. And if you could do it, it would be an amazing thing. Thank you. As I say, we're gonna be looking at Christmas this week. Now, this is something that I've had to adapt over time with my daughter. We've discovered that there are elements of Christmas that are fabulous and there are elements of Christmas that are really, really challenging. So we're going to be looking at what we do for our Christmas and how we've managed to work it for, for my daughter and for how we make it something that is uh, a good time of year and not something that's uh, riddled with stress and anxiety. So Christmas is something that I, personally I love. And it's a, it's a wonderful time of year and you can see it in the families and there is a general joy and happiness that comes around Christmas and you see the best in people a lot of the time at Christmas as well as often the worst as well. But uh, I do love that, you know, it, it's a time where people will forget the selfishness and they tend to be a lot more selfless at Christmas. It's a wonderful thing and you see some fantastic stuff happen. But for my daughter, Christmas is a real challenge. She loves Christmas, so she's very wrapped up in all of the, no, no pun intended, oh. very wrapped up in the, the, the goings in Christmas. And obviously, you know, like any kid, very excited about the presents. And I think we've gone through about 600 different Christmas lists this year because one of her pastimes at the moment is to hop onto Amazon and have a look for what could be a good Christmas list this year. And she's messaged everybody she knows with suggestions, which <laughs> they're taking in very good humor, thankfully. <laughs> And it's, it's just one of those things, uh, but it's a wonderful thing to see and, and, and the fact that she does love it is a wonderful thing. The problem we have is that Christmas is riddled with sensory overload. Now we've talked before about sensory processing disorder a lot and that's you know one of the, the uh, comorbid conditions that's been assigned to my daughter with her diagnosis of autism. And it can be a real challenge for her and it's not something she's even necessarily aware of. What I mean by this is you think about what happens at Christmas. The lights go on and everywhere you go, there's flashing lights everywhere. There's, uh, you know, strung up on the trees in, in the center of our town. It's, it's a lovely place and they've got lovely lights and they're, they're quite subtle, but they're still there. And it's still in all the shop windows and everyone's talking about Christmas and what are you going to get this year? What presents are you going to get? And you go into the shops and there's the same Christmas music playing in every single shop, which drives me nuts. But, you know, that's me. <laughs> uh, but for Missouri, it's like there's this constant elevation of anxiety and the day draws closer and the schools are talking about it more. And. Uh, everybody, you know, everybody you meet is asking, oh, are you looking forward to Christmas? Oh, yes, you know, and it's this excitement of building and building. Now, going right back to the very start of this channel when I did my first video, the first thing we talked about was the relationship between anxiety and autism. And basically, the central core of uh, being an autistic person is an elevated sense of anxiety. So I've likened it before to the cup, and I'll use this analogy again because it's just so apt. We've got this internal cup that can take so much emotion, positive, negative, in between, whatever. It's an emotional cup that's able to manage and, and contain our excitement, our frustrations, our stress, our happiness, and it all sits there in this cup. And for someone like myself, my cup's you know half full, shall we say, <laughs> most of the time. It's going up and down, basically. As things get excited, it may fill, it may, and you know, th then you can control that and you bring it back down. For my daughter, that cup is almost constantly at its peak. So it's only ever very close to the top or at the top. She's always containing this wealth of emotion that's stuck in there, and that leads to anxiety. And when that cup fills, that's when it overflows. That's when you get the challenging behaviors so strongly associated with autism and neurodiversity. It all comes spilling over the top and that's when you get meltdowns. It's when you get uh, the challenging behaviors and the aggression and all the stuff that, you know, we try to avoid. And it's why, you know, for, for a number of years for us, Christmas was a really stressful time, more stressful than it, it generally is, I think, for, for parents and for, for people. 
for us, it was a time of, oh, what are we going to be? We knew we were going to have at some point a meltdown in the day, probably several, as the frustration builds and that emotion has to come out. That cup just sits so full and it's just overflowing constantly. And it made that you'd always have that point in the day where it was going to just all turn ugly. And we've had to learn how to restrict our Christmas in a, in a positive way so that it's an enjoyable time for everyone and we don't reach, if possible, that point of, of meltdown and, and the behaviours that come and, and can sp spoil it for everybody. And that's not my daughter's intention. She can't help that. But it puts a, a, a taint on the day. And how do we avoid that? So one thing we've done is that we try to avoid the big Christmas shop. Now, again, you know, as I said before, the, the problem is that everything is so elevated over Christmas because you've got the lights, you've got the music, there's crowds, there's more people, even with COVID and, and all that kind of stuff, everyone supposedly social distancing and all that kind of stuff. It just, it's still there. There's this hustle and bustle and tension in the air and it all builds up and for my daughter that kind of thing crowds and and loudness and lights all really affect her and it's an important thing to say at this point this is this is my daughter this is what we do for my daughter you may well have different needs and different in fact you likely will have different needs and different approaches that you're going to need to take to make it work for you and it's taking the time to sit back and assess that so this is what worked for us hopefully some of this will help for you but it's really important to make sure you spend that time to reflect what is it that we can see is triggering behaviors, triggering meltdowns, and how can we avoid that happening on the day leading up to the day, you know, in the, in the aftermath of Christmas, all that sort of stuff. So these are the sort of things that we do so that we can get through our Christmas. This life hacks for Christmas for uh, families with autism in the mix. So shopping is, uh, say, the big one. We don't tend to go out on the big shop. The beauty of the, the world we live in at the, these days is that we have online shopping and it's been a really good thing and it's actually something nice that my daughter's been able to go away, have a look through her tablet or phone or whatever and have a look at what she wants for Christmas and make herself a list and then we can just order it. And it probably costs a little bit more when you're going through these things but then, you know, Amazon can be a lot cheaper than a lot of places. There's, there's always options. Um, you know, there's so much stuff online. Any shop worth its salt has got, some, you know, except for obviously local shops, we'll find that more challenging. But for for what we need, it's it's magic that we can just go onto uh, onto Amazon, onto online shopping, and we can make the orders, and they can come. And the great thing is, they're usually delivered during the school day, so we get them. We can go and hide them because that was a massive thing that we struggled with was that my daughter would be so excited about seeing the present and and knowing where it was kept and you know, spent most of her time trying to work out ways to break into cupboards and uh, get past locks so she could see what she got for Christmas. And so uh, the, just being able to time it like that, that things were arriving when the kids weren't around made it a lot easier to get it, wrap it, pop it away, locked out of the way so they don't know where it is. And it just takes away again that anxiety and, and that sort of frustration. The fact that she's not seen them and she's not it's not playing on her mind makes a huge difference to how we are on those anxiety levels as we ebb towards Christmas. And that brings me to the next point I've got is we've taken away surprise for my daughter. And that sounds like a horrible thing. For, for me, I don't I don't want to know what I've got for Christmas. I love the idea of opening up something and not knowing what it is and oh wow, look what you've got me, you know, the excitement. And for me, that's a wonderful thing, but for her, that's the excitement and the anxiety and stuff like that. The surprise creates a level of tension for her that she can't stand and she'll openly tell us i hate surprises i don't like them so allowing her to make a christmas list and saying okay well, we can tick that off tick that off tick that off get all this stuff in place means that she's got an idea of what she's getting and there's still an excitement there about getting the stuff that she wants but that that fear attachment of maybe it's not something i want how am i going to react all that kind of stuff isn't there knowing what she's getting and knowing what she's pretty well unwrapping on the day well, and we'll get to unwrapping in a sec, but what she's getting on the day mate, is, is a huge thing for her and it, it makes a big difference to how she enjoys the day and how we avoid those triggers that are going to lead to meltdowns uh, on Christmas Day and, and, and through, the, through the Christmas break. And that brings us to wrapping. Now, wrapping is something, again, it's, it's a real part of Christmas is you unwrap your presents. For my daughter, that can be a real 
stress in herself. Like it, it, again, it creates that anxiety and it's, it's a noise, it's a texture, it's this little thing. We still wrap our presents now. We went through a period where we didn't and we were just using bags that she could just open and pull the stuff out. It created just that little bit less tension at the time, knowing what she was getting, just having the bags that she could just sort of, oh, there we go. It's still kind of hidden, but it took away that element of surprise that was still there. She's, she likes the idea of wrapping now and being able to unwrap something. And you know, I think probably a form of masking, to be honest. She sees that's what other people like and that's what she wants. That's what she's chosen. And with PDA in the mix, giving her that element of control to choose what she wants to do for Christmas makes a huge difference. So if you don't understand PDA, you want to know more about it, do look at the uh, link in the description. But uh, and that will explain everything about PDA and, and what we deal with as, as a, a family living with PDA in our day-to-day -day lives. So giving her that control is a huge thing and it makes a big difference to how she's able to cope with the day. We've experimented with different ways of doing the presents on the day. Do we just do it all in one go in the morning and then let it go or do we we've tried spreading it out to be honest spreading it out created more problems for us i put i thought at the time there was less tent you know it's only a few things and there'll be a few things later but the excitement of knowing something was coming up in another hour or so and then another created more tension it wasn't worth it so we do the whole lot in one go uh and and we we said it that way it just really works for us we do the stocking so that there's something for our kids to open when they get up i don't know what it's like in your family but in our house it tends to be 4 30 a.m five o'clock they're up Wait, it's christmas so they've got something to open but we say that we, we we set a time well ahead and we establish it and we talk about it all the time so presents won't be till 7 30 8 o'clock whatever time we've set that's when we're going to be up and that's when we're going to be opening is everyone a chance to wake up and get ready and be a bit fresh and we can go down and open our presents and, and that's a good thing. The fact that we've established it beforehand sets that expectation and it's woven it in. And we've presented that again, tackling the PDA side of things. We've, we've taken that to what time would you prefer? We can do 7.30, we could do eight, we could do 8.30, what would you rather? And we let them pick knowing that probably it's gonna be 7.30, <laughs> that's just the way it's gonna be. But uh, giving that element of decision-making, that, that element of control back to my daughter, again makes things just that she, she feels like she's chosen that time she's set the time and it means we're not all up at 5 a.m having to sort of deal with the chaos we, we do get a chance to sort of get up at, at some semblance of a reasonable time and get downstairs and be refreshed with a cup of coffee and uh whatever else add the cinnamon for christmas whatever you like uh but yeah that that's how we we've chosen to play it and it seems to be something that's worked for the last couple of years for christmas with this is giving that element of control in there whilst also achieving our own needs within the day. Another thing we do is that we have activities planned in the day. We will go for a walk. We will plan to do that depending on the weather, how we're gonna do it. Even if it's just hopping in the car and going out for a drive somewhere, breaking the four walls and getting out and breaking the cabin fever is a big thing. I've talked a lot about the fact that my daughter struggles when she's cooped up all day. It's kind of changed a bit as she's hit adolescence and uh, with the onset of puberty, she's a lot more wanting to just sort of chill and stuff at home but we do know that if we don't have something planned where we're going to be going out and just doing something and it's low key and i think that's the key we, we, it's a low key thing that we do it's just going for a nice walk it's just going for a drive you know we're lucky that we live in devon and we can go up onto exmoor and stuff like that just have a drive around view the sights if it's freezing outside it doesn't matter we've got the heater in the car it can be comfortable and it's just something different it only takes a short amount of time and it just breaks the day up what happens when we do and it's something that can't be controlled sometimes you will get that meltdown occur now i've talked about meltdowns and if you want more information on really how to cope with the tips and tricks or side of things for, for dealing with meltdowns there's a link in the description do go check it out but on the day it's where we come back to what i call compartmentalization and it's something i really struggle to do but it's something i've recognized in myself that i need to do and it's very easy that when we reach that point it can color the mood of the whole day if something happens and my daughter does melt down it feels like oh well that's the day ruined and it's very easy to feel like that I've had to learn and I had to remind myself constantly to compartmentalize this stuff. If there's a meltdown, it's a moment in the day. Being able to go, right, that's done, we move on and make a conscious decision that we're not gonna let that color the rest of the day. 
makes a huge difference for, for, for what it's like in our home. Previously, before I learned this about myself and about our family, it would be that way. You'd feel like, well, that's it. That's Christmas ruined again, you know, and it's so deflating and it's so counterproductive. Being able to compartmentalize it, put it in a box and say, you know what? That was a moment in time and we've moved on. What can we do now that's going to be some fun? It made a huge difference to me. I mean, it's something that in general life I find makes it wherever we go, whatever we do, if there's a meltdown, being able to compartmentalize it, if there's challenging behaviors, being able to put them in the box and say, that's in the past, let's not dwell on it now. Let's go on with enjoying our day. Makes a huge, huge difference. Another thing that we found really works for my family is keeping the kids involved in every aspect. Now this, what I'm getting at is seems like doing the Christmas dinner. So we, we're gonna have the roast, we're gonna do that kind of thing. What we've actually established is that my daughter doesn't like turkey and actually my son's not that fussed on it either. My wife doesn't like it. I'm the only one who's kind of like, oh, well, I like my turkey, thank you very much. But so what we've done is we've allowed the kids to pick what they'd like for their Christmas roast. So I was suspecting it would be chicken or something like that. Actually, what my daughter's chosen is pork. So we've got a little pork joint that we're going to put on specifically for her. We can all share in it uh, and, you know, we can enjoy it that way. And uh, the other thing they wanted was some, both the kids was some gammon. So we've got a little gammon joint, a nice honey glazed one that will be really tasty. And we're going to do that so there's going to be a couple of different roast options but it's something that they've chosen and again it's giving that element of control back to my daughter that she feels that she's had something in this when it comes to doing the cooking and stuff like that allowing my daughter to be involved in that process really really helps she wants to be involved and allowing her to be able to do that in safe and, and considered ways and obviously monitored ways I'm not going to have her go and check in the, <laughs> the roast in the oven at any point, opening up and getting blasted with the heat in the face and burning hands on pans. That's not going to work. But if I'm in there with her and we do it together and she feels involved, it makes a huge difference to how she processes. And it's something that's it's an activity in the day and it's something that she really enjoys. And cooking is, funnily enough, one of the things that she really has identified with as being something that's a real passion for her. And, you know, it's, it's something that potentially could be a career for her down the track. And it's one of those things that if we can involve her and, and encourage this in her it's only going to help us it's only going to be something that's so beneficial so involving her in that and and she's chosen what veg she wants she i don't know where she gets it from she loves sprouts <laughs> i can't stand them my wife can't stand them my son hates them but my daughter loves sprouts and i'm certain that's pda i'm certain it's because the rest of us don't want them that she's decided she has to have them <laughs> she's just pda all over but hey she's eating sprouts <laughs> more than i could ever say and so uh, she's chosen that so it's it's she's been able to have a real input into how the food is going to be on the day and it's something that we've learned to do over time in, in general if, if we allow her choice in food to pick ahead we have a much better success rate with her eating properly and at least getting some some healthy nutritious food in her uh, and, and avoiding the whole brown food syndrome that you that so many autistic people kids get stuck into and, and, and it makes it's just a much easier time for it and that way the day's built and we've got a plan and that's a big key it's something we learned over lockdown and being in isolation and having to do schoolwork and stuff is that we have a plan for the day now and we realized it was really important and it seemed like something that was counterintuitive as far as pda goes having a rigid schedule would be the the wrong thing to do why would you do that that's just going to you know create more issues and tension and, and, and stress what why would we do that what we found was rather than having a rigid schedule it was something a bit flexible so we knew we had to do certain things within the day and this is sort of what we're doing with christmas knowing roughly when things are going to be but giving a sort of chance for so we're going to this is what is planned in the day so you know we know ahead that we're going to have dinner we're going to have the rest we're going to have the presents we're going to have the stockings we're going to have the calls with family and the, you know hellos and, and merry christmases we're going to have that time to just head out and go for a drive or for a walk or whatever and you know maybe let the the christmas dinner settle uh all that kind of stuff Knowing those things are there and just if, if they're there for, for my daughter visually, it can help uh, and it lets her feel in control. If she's in charge of the schedule, she's, she's quite, you know, it's, the, it's the control thing. She becomes very passionate about everything being on time and, and all that kind of stuff. So 
we can do these things and, and it actually allows us to do things that we may not have been able to do because she's in charge of the schedule and making sure that we sort of stick to something and it really helps. Huge difference in how the day goes and, and it makes a big difference. The other thing we've done over the last year or so, Christmas was a time that we had a lot of family and, and um, you know, we'd be going to houses or they'd be coming to us on the day. We'd have people come visit for a few days. My mum and my brother live in the UK, but they're, they're a fair distance from us. So being able to actually, uh, you know, invite them over for a period of time was a nice thing, but it created more aggravation and tension. What we do now is we tend to have Christmas Day very quietly, and then we'll have another Christmas Day on Boxing Day with my wife's family, and then we might have a, a couple of days going and visiting my my mum and my brother and uh, having that sort of family. Actually makes it nice because you're having it over a few days anyway, so it sort of spreads it around and it makes it feel good. But not having that extra pressure of people with us on Christmas Day, making it just a very quiet family affair between our immediate family has, is something that's really helped. And it's something that my family has recognized. I'm very fortunate in that I have an understanding and accepting family. Uh, and you know, my, my mother-in-law is a, a star with this kind of stuff. And if she knows something's gonna help make things better for my daughter, she will be there. She's a fantastic nana. And the same with my mum. You know, it's, it's a wonderful thing. And it's, it's really great that we got that support. And a lot of people have, don't have family that understand and support in that way. And it can be really difficult. All I can say is get them to watch something like this. <laughs> get them to understand how autism works and why it's so important that we adhere to these things. Because in the end, I don't know about you guys, I kind of got over Christmas. Christmas is a lovely time, but it, it, it's something that is just there for me in, in a sense. As you get older, I think it gets a bit like that until you have kids, until you have grandkids. And then that magic seeps back in and it's a really exciting time again. And it's a really wonderful time. And that's because we see and we relive it, I think, in our kids. And we see the, the joy, the re re reminded of our own excitement and the joy that we used to get at that age. And it's something I, I, I never want to take away. And it's, it's a wonderful thing to see. And I, I, I came late to life with the family, I guess. I was, you know, uh, in my late 30s when, when, I, when we first had kids. And... I never thought it was going to happen at that point. And then suddenly here I was with a family and it's, it's a joy. And I went from being a bit, <laughs> a bit Scrooge to somebody who really embraces and loves Christmas now. And that's because of my kids. That's because of having the family there. I want my kids to love their Christmas. And these are just ways that we found that we can embrace the neurodiversity that's within our family and we can make it work and be a joyous time for us. I hope that's helped. Uh, I wish you all the merriest of Christmases. And if you uh, want to make my Christmas very merry, please do go hit like and subscribe. Ring the bell so that you know when new content's coming up. It makes a huge difference to me. I really thank you. I thank you so much for having joined me through this year. And I look forward to the next year and, and the things that we'll explore. Have a great Christmas. Have a great new year and stay safe.